amazed that it, that it are any of you here with the rain going the way it's going. But I appreciate the fact that you've come. And Nan is here. And Kathy is here. And so I guess we can start. First thing I want to... <laughs> First thing I want to uh, talk about is the a couple of you have asked questions about that 400 word paper that is voluntary. You don't have to do it if you do not want. It's worth uh, 20 points. And, uh, and most of you are wondering whether you can really write a paper in just 400 words. And I am reminded of uh, I'm reminded of everything except his name. I'm reminded of a person who uh, said sometime about uh, writing a letter. At the end of the letter, he said, I uh, would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have enough time. The point is that uh, 400 words does not make it easier. It makes it harder. And the reason you're going to be sending just a few brief words to me about uh, about what you want to write about is that the, I, I, the thing that I'm most interested in doing is narrowing the topic. It can't be, for example, as uh, one that came in, be on, and this woman understood it. She said, I, it's such a broad topic, I, I'll, I'll need help on narrowing it. But it couldn't be on AIDS, for example. That is such a broad topic, you can't really just cover AIDS in that. But you can cover a very specific aspect of AIDS, and uh, uh, and still 400 words might be a challenge. And that's the difficulty of it. What you have to do is figure out how in 400 words to say what to make the points you want to make. So you start out by, so you start out by uh, deciding what the points are that you have to make, the two or three points, and then you have to figure out how to fit it into, uh, into 400 words. Uh, in any case, that uh, is due next Monday, November 14th. And what I would like you to do is send them to the TA. You have his, uh, do they have, they have your uh, uh, email address? And so, uh, and so send it to him, and uh, he will, uh, uh, he'll, he'll uh, process it properly. He's the one that's going to determine and make certain that uh, it's recorded in, uh, in, in your full grade for the, uh, for the course. So that's one point I wanted to make before we start. Another is um, there was a student, and because there are lots of people absent today, he may not be here, but there was a student who talked to me about Mendel and some of the problems that people have had with Mendel and his data in the past. Is that person here? There. Uh, I would, uh, when we get to the point in the lecture, I'd like you to just make the point that you made about Mendel and some of the difficulties with Mendel. You can do it in Chinese if that makes you more comfortable. And, um, and I, have a re I have a specific reason for that. It's a very important, uh, very important point, and lots of people may have gotten that same message. So we'll, uh, uh, hopefully I'll remember when we get to that point to, uh, to call in. Now, just one other thing about the way uh, things are going to go uh, today. We will uh, start uh, with, uh, since I only got about three uh, slides into this lecture last time, I will um, uh, uh, go over them again and then go further on into, into, the, into the lecture about, uh, about genes. And then uh, at an appropriate point, I will stop and uh, we will have uh, the quiz and the break back to back, and then we'll come back and finish the uh, and finish the lecture. So that's how we're going to spend our our time. So let's begin right here, and we're talking about genes and uh, where they are and what they are. As a matter of fact, it's uh, quite amazing at what has was discovered and learned without ever knowing for sure where the genes were because there was so much that related uh, to genes uh, and, uh, and, and yet people were able to make great discoveries. 
certainly Darwin is one of them. We'll talk some about Mendel. And uh, you'll realize that it just seems almost impossible to have figured this out. But that's hindsight. And what we're going to do is, as we've been doing all along, is take it from uh, the, the, the way things were at the time that the, the, the discovery was made. What, we, what we've always known about genes is that they seem to determine what we look like because we tend to uh, look like our parents. And what I need is the clicker that we're going on. And that was the example I gave. But you could give a million examples of, of, of mother and daughter looking alike. And we know it in plants as well. You breed the uh, uh, similar looking plants with each other, like red roses, for example, and you're highly likely to get red roses. Not guaranteed, but highly likely uh, to, uh, uh, to get them. So, so um, genes have been on people's minds for a long time, and little by little we've been learning what they do. But the big discovery, the big discovery that we'll get to is uh, what they, uh, uh, where they are and what they're, what they're made of. And we'll, do that by taking a quick trip through the cell, and that's what we're going to to do uh, to do today. Uh, this was the, the, another one that we looked at. It's uh, dwarfism. This one is a little more complex because you can get the same effect at many different places in um, in in the in the sequence of events that leads to normal uh, normal size. Uh, this was. Uh, this, this one is interesting, uh, and again, I talked about it very briefly. It has to do with earlobes and, and whether they are attached or not. And one of the things that we noticed is that uh, most Asians have uh, unattached earlobes. That happens to be the dominant uh, uh, circumstance. That means that you can have a, um, uh, all you need is one of the two genes. Uh, and, and I'll make the point here, but we're going to come back to it later. We have two genes for every particular characteristic that we want to talk about. That's true for humans. It gets a little more complex than some other organisms. But that's true for humans. And so we have two genes. And one is dominant, uh, can, can be dominant over the other. So in the case of uh, how earlobes are attached, we have two genes for that. One of them says, attached earlobes, and one of them says uh, unattached. If you, have unatta if, if you happen to get an, uh, the gene for unattached from your mother and the gene for attached from your father, you will uh, uh, have, again, the dominant gene will, will, will be the one that uh, shows, will, will determine what, you, what your body looks like. And in this case, it's the unattached that is dominant. So all of you with unattached earlobes, and myself included, uh, have at least one gene for unattached, because it's dominant. So the other gene could be attached. Wouldn't make any difference. We've got one gene for attached, and that's, uh, and that's why this happens. And the example I gave of how this can suddenly become relevant in one's life had to do with uh, a man who discovered was one day noticing that he had two daughters. And first of all, he knew that he and his wife. I wonder if that's what, 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 maybe that's the monitor there. I don't know. I'll have to stay away from it, perhaps. Um, uh, he he knew that he and his wife both had attached uh, earlobes. And remember, that's recessive. That is not dominant. That means they both had the two recessive genes. And then one day he happened to notice that his youngest daughter, uh, just like you would uh, expect, had attached earlobes. But his oldest daughter, his first daughter, did not. His first daughter had uh, unattached earlobes. And if you think about that for a while, you realize that we, what he had discovered is that his, uh, his uh, oldest daughter was not his own. It was somebody else's. Uh, now, the, the, the incredible thing about the fact that we have these two genes and that one can be dominant over the other, there's dominant and recessive, the incredible th thing about that is that Gregor Mendel is the one that discovered it. 
and he discovered it entirely through breeding pea plants. So the first thing you have to remember is that plant cells and animal cells are virtually identical. They operate the same way with regard to uh, uh, inheritance and, uh, and all of the things that we'll talk about today. Uh, that he could discover that uh, as uh, the, both the dominance and the fact that there must be two genes for every characteristic uh, just, again, in, in hindsight, boggles, uh, boggles the mind. And, uh, and he, did, got, he learned all of this. He got all of this information by breeding pea plants. And this information applies to you and to me and to cats and mice just as much as it applies to the pea plants with which he worked. I'm not so sure that he realized that at the time, but, uh, but that is, in fact, the, 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 the case. And what he uh, did was pick out several characteristics. This, again, is Gregor Mendel. Ah, here's where I wanted to talk. Now, what, what was your, we're going to talk some more about Gregor Mendel, but what was your concern about Gregor Mendel? Uh, when I was in secondary school, my, my teacher, who would teach my, me mathematics, said the Mendel's the experience, uh, nowadays, there are some people do the same experience, but can't get the same result. Yeah. So that means the data maybe uh, was created by the Mendel. Yes. There was a time, that w and it happened about 20 years ago, when people started to look very carefully. I'm going to just kind of repeat what was just said very carefully at the data. And they just could not get it uh, the way that Mendel got it. It was not as clear as what he got. And so they assumed that Mendel must have made it all up, that, that it just didn't make sense, that he got such good data. Later, it was determined, based on information that was gotten from other places, that Mendel did make a mistake. He made a very important mistake as a scientist. And remember, he's not a trained scientist. He's a trained monk. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but he made a very important uh, uh, mistake. Uh, and that was, after a while, and you'll see how that could be, after a while, he began to know when he was going to get, uh, let's say, a three to one ratio in, in the, in, if he was doing uh, this experiment uh, right here, uh, he, knew, uh, and, and he would, to, to get the right numbers, he would do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and then count all of the all of the piece. You can't just do one experiment because these genes can divide differently. So you have to do hundreds. And he would then be counting his P, the P's here, to decide uh, what the ratio was going to be. And he would get to a, a certain place. Maybe he had, let's say, 700 P's to count. And he would get to a certain place in the counting, let's say up to about 350. and the ratio was almost like, it was, it was three to one. And so he said to himself, I don't have to count anymore. I'm just going to quit counting. I'll stop right here. It's very clearly going to be three to one. And in other cases, it didn't quite zero in on the ratio he was expected. And so he would continue counting uh, more. So what he was doing was, in a sense, this is, and sometimes it's referred to as selecting data. You like the data as they look, and so you you, you take them and you don't do anything. You don't do anything to change them because they really look the way you were expecting them to turn out. Uh, so that's what he did. And, and he didn't, uh, remember, he wasn't doing this for any particular person. He wasn't doing this to become famous or anything at all. He was just doing it to satisfy himself about the way things worked. So it wasn't he was trying to cheat or, or, or be dishonest, but he did something you should never ever do, and that is he only he, he quit counting when the data looked the way he wanted them to look. So that was Mendel's uh, uh, mistake. Not that he uh, drew wrong conclusions about the data or anything else, but I really appreciate you are bringing this up because about 15 years ago, it began to be uh, taught uh, in some schools and in, even in some universities that Mendel. Uh, that, that one shouldn't really pay much attention to Mendel because he surely must have made up his data. In hindsight, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, he didn't have any notion about what the data were going to look like. He was just doing these crosses with pea plants and, 
and, uh, and following the results. Uh, so he did experiments like, like uh, this one, and, um, and he slowly but surely accumulated lots of information. And when you think about it, he was looking at, uh, uh, he was looking at a lot of different characteristics. He was looking at the, the, the look of the seed, smooth versus, here they say dented, but uh, wrinkled is another way this is described, or green versus yellow. And, uh, uh, and same, similarly with the pea pods and uh, with the flower colors. So he had lots of characteristics that he could be looking at and, um, and deciding uh, uh, what the, and determining what the ratios were and so on. Now in this particular uh, case, you might think about this. Uh, he, in this case, he comes up with a three to one ratio, but uh, and each of them has two genes for the characteristic of this, this one, this parent, or this uh, seed has two genes for the color. Uh, this has, I mean, pardon me, for the shape of the seed, which is smooth. This one has two genes for the shape, which is wrinkled, and so on. And, and, and by doing this rather easy experiment, uh, he ends up getting a, a three to one, three to one ratio. But as you can see, these smooth seeds are not, they're the same on the surface, but they're not the same inside. They've got a different, they've got, these are smooth because, uh, because, the, because smooth is dominant, and they, all they need is one dominant gene, so they're both smooth. This one is smooth also, but it has two dominant genes, and the, and the experiment that you might think about is, how could you, how could you determine which of these seeds was too dominant and which was dominant plus, uh, plus recessive because there is a very simple experiment that one can do, uh, a simple uh, back cross that one can do to find that out. So you think about that for, for a while. All right, so again, just to make this point that is so very important, Mendel, um, came up with these two, he came up with lots of conclusions. He knew lots of, learned lots of things about uh, these pea plants. And, uh, and one of them was that these genes came in pairs. Um, and in the case of earlobes, we had unattached and attached. In the case of pea, the shape of the pea, it was wrinkled and, and smooth and so on. They, so they came in pairs. That was one thing that he discovered. And the other he discovered was that one of these, they came in pairs, but one of the, one of the two types could be uh, dominant over the other. Now again, those were, you have to really be into genetics, but if you're into genetics, they were earth shaking, that he could draw the conclusion, like I say, you have to be into genetics, but it, that, 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 you could, that you could draw those conclusions from the simple kinds of experiments that he was doing. So he was pretty impressed with his own work, and he thought, well, I'm going to write this up in a paper, and I'll send it to uh, the, uh, one of the main uh, journals of the day. No typewriters back then. This happens to be the first page of the paper that he, uh, uh, that he submitted. And uh, the people that reviewed it at the journal said, great work. This is really interesting stuff. I don't think that we've ever seen anything like this before. And we accept your paper. Here's this guy, never published any papers before, wasn't known as a scientist, but they accepted this, uh, uh, this, this paper. So at that time, uh, even though it was a very difficult process at that time, he was given 40 copies of his own of just his article, not the whole journal, but just his article. And he could send those out to people to get, uh, just to say, here's some work I did. In case you didn't see it in the journal, here's a copy of your own. And he got no response at all. And he sent, for example, he sent one to Darwin. Now, this work was very relevant and important to the work that Darwin was doing. But somehow, Darwin either just got lost in a pile on his desk or he didn't quite catch the connection, he didn't understand the connection, and so Mendel never heard anything from anybody. Nobody got back to Mendel and said, wow, great work, this is really fabulous work. We think you're a great scientist. And so he kind of lost interest 
in doing what he was doing. He had opportunities to do other things uh, at the monastery, and so he did. And he didn't follow up on this at all, and died when he was age uh, 62, uh, never realizing that he was, to this very day, in going to be one of the superstars of genetics, because he made these major, major uh, discoveries. And the way that happened was that in 1905, in 1905, other people were doing experiments with other organisms, namely with fruit flies. I just had a little fruit fly flying around my desk, and I intended to bring it here in case you don't know for sure what a fruit fly is, but I didn't. It got away from me. But anyway, fruit flies was one of the things that, the, that, they were, that were experiments were done with. And another was a, a, a fungus called Neurospora. And so experiments were done with these two organisms, and in fact, um, they showed this whole business that Mendel had discovered. And so they published this paper, and they said, and, and they said you aren't going to believe what we just discovered. Two, kind, two genes for every characteristic. One's dominant over the other, and the whole thing. And then somebody, after that came out, somebody said, you know, I just happened to stumble across this paper published way back in 1865 by somebody called Mendel. I never heard of him. I don't know who he is. But came to all of the same conclusions. And these scientists uh, that had discovered it in 1905 were very good about the whole thing. And uh, they said, we thought we had made a great discovery, but we weren't the first to make it. Mendel had made it, but he didn't, nobody seemed to know about uh, Mendel. So we apologize. Uh, but it's still a great discovery. And what we have determined is that it works not only for pea plants, but it works for animals, the fruit flies. And it works for fungi, the uh, Neurospora. So things went on uh, from there. And um, it reminds us that great people made incredible discoveries only looking, looking at about what was going on inside the cell even though they could not themselves get inside the cell and, uh, and, and look at what was going on there and maybe determine what was changing to make these differences. I mean, they knew, for example, that there was protein inside the cell. And they knew, for example, that there were nucleic acids. And they knew that there were different nucleic acids. There was DNA and there was RNA, not exactly what they called it. So they knew that kind of thing, but they just, um, did not know where these genes uh, resided. Uh, they, they, in fact, well, let me just leave it at that. They didn't know where they resided. So um, let's take a trip into the cell and uh, find where they resided. I expect most people here know uh, where that it is because uh, this kind of thing is taught now in, in, in um, in, in uh, high school science. But let's go way back. Instead of just talking about it, let's go way back and, and follow how it was determined and discovered where, uh, where, the, uh, where the genes were. And, and to, to know this for sure, you have to go back a long way. This guy's name is Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was able to make some of the first important discoveries because he was also the person that was able to make the first microscope. And this is a picture of the microscope that he made. And then he could look uh, at things up close and personal. And this particular thing that he's looking at here is a very thin slice of cork. He just sliced uh, a thin piece of cork and then uh, looked at it under the microscope and made a drawing. This isn't a picture. Uh, it's a drawing that he made, uh, supposedly he made. I'll come back to this in, in, a, in a bit. But anyway, this is a drawing that was, let's say, it was made. And this is what he saw when he cut a thin slice of uh, cork. And he called those uh, cells. Why did he call them cells? I don't know. Anybody? Why would he call them cells? Remember, cells, nobody, nobody was calling anything cells when it came to the plants. But there was another kind of cell. 
It was the small rooms that monks lived in. And uh, that's, what, that's kind of what he saw here. He saw the layout of the rooms in which monks lived. And that's why he called them uh, cells. Uh, and he wrote a bestseller. He wrote and drew a bestseller. And the reason was he now, with this new gadget, could make, he could see things like nobody had ever seen them before. People knew about fleas. They knew there was this little dot that leaped off the, uh, off the pet when they scratched and, and pushed. So he knew about, uh, uh, people knew about fleas, but they never ever saw them in this kind of detail. And people knew from looking at the head of a fly that this is, that was probably going to look very much like this, but they never saw it in this detail. And this is uh, a louse or one of the, uh, some, an organism from among the lice. And, uh, and just these great pictures. And this was a bestseller. It was a bestseller for 50 weeks, uh, a book, because people were just so flabbergasted with, uh, with these uh, drawings. Now, the reason I hesitated when I said Hook made these drawings is because he had a young man uh, working for him. Uh, the man's name was Christopher Wren. I think he was 16, 15 or 16 at the time. And he had an unusual talent, an unusual drawing talent, which came up later when he became an architect and he started to draw buildings in the way bu uh, buildings should be constructed. So Christopher Wren uh, was, was very good at drawing and he worked in Hook's uh, laboratory. So lots of people think that it was probably Christopher Wren that made these beautiful, uh, beautiful drawings. I was in London not very long ago and was looking from one side of the Thames to the other and there was one of these metal placards that shows you, points out what, what the buildings are that you're looking at. And it's amazing at how many of the buildings on the, on the, on the London skyline were designed by, uh, by Christopher Arendt. So a great, great architect, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, is the best known of things that he's done. But where did he get his start? He got his start drawing the eyes of a fly and things like that. That's how he uh, got that good. Now, how could they do this? Because, they, because Hook invented the microscope. Long before the microscope was invented, the telescope was invented, and we've talked about that. This same way people found uh, little uh, bits of glass that had gone onto the floor and flattened out, and they noticed that, they, that these could be used to magnify uh, things. And so uh, uh, people figured that you could, uh, you could make eyeglasses from them. Uh, for example, that was one of the things that was done early on, and the telescope. But the microscope was much more complex with regard to uh, the final product, and so it didn't come for 50 years or, or so. Uh, several of you in the room have uh, glasses on, I noticed. You are probably nearsighted. That's the thing that usually shows up uh, in young people. I was extremely nearsighted, nearsighted when I was uh, young. and. Uh, one day, I, uh, somebody had uh, laid their glasses on a windowsill at the school that I went to. And just, uh, I, I didn't realize I was so uh, nearsighted. I thought everybody was like this, right? I mean, you don't ask about these things. And I picked up his glasses, and I put them on, and I was amazed. All of a sudden, some of you might have this memory, I could see the leaves on the trees and everything. And I was just flabbergasted. I didn't want to give him his glasses back because they were so good and they made such a difference for me. I eventually had uh, the predecessor to LASIK. Do you call it LASIK in Taiwan? LASIK surgery, where they peel back the cornea and then they use a, a laser to shave the. Well, anyway, it's a new kind of thing that they that they do with, uh, especially with people for people that have uh, that are nearsighted. And uh, I still wear glasses, but they are clear at the top. I wear them because I read a lot, and they're reading glasses at the bottom. Anyway, uh, that's probably how people felt when these first eyeglasses were, were made. Uh, they could look through these. I'm sure this looked better when it was first uh, uh, used, but it's actually an ancient uh, uh, pair that would go back the, the 
many, many years. Uh, and um, I mentioned already that Galilei, G Galileo uh, had invented the telescope and got in trouble because of it, remember, because he was able to see the stars better and drew certain conclusions about the stars. So that was in invented before uh, the microscope. But again, 50 years later, uh, along came the microscope and Hooke uh, got unusually famous because of what he could now see under uh, the microscope. Just mention this. I don't know if you know this about the flea, but the flea uh, is really a great leaper. In fact, it can leap 200. This has nothing to do with the, this, what I'm teaching you right now, but anyway, let me just tell you about the flea. It can leap 200 times uh, its, its uh, body length, 200 times. Multiply that for yourself and think about how high you could uh, be leaping if you had the, the capacity of a, of a flea. Okay, uh, just a f um, few more things about this. So, so uh, there now is a microscope available, and you can start looking at cells more closely. And one of the things that uh, people looked at, uh, in this case, uh, Hartsucker, uh, looked at sperm. Can you see? Can you see what's inside the head of this sperm? Can you see that from way in the back of the room, or anybody can can see it? That's an actually a little person inside the sperm. And Hartsucker said, well. That's obviously because every, all of the important characteristics of the eventual baby comes from the man. And that's why everything is right there already. This is pre-formation. It's all formed in the sperm. Uh, not everybody necessarily agreed with that. And in fact, that's not exactly what he said. He said, I, I can't quite see it because the membrane around the sperm is milky. But I, I know that if I could just see through that membrane, this is what I would see. I would see this pre-formed a uh, human being, and uh, and of course that was uh, did not turn out to be true. It just as we were talking about, half the genes from the man, half the genes from the woman, and um, and uh, that's 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 how uh, new organisms are formed. Now there are different ways that um, when we think about. I'm going to stop here uh, in just two more uh, slides. Uh, I want to talk, this, there are, remember this, we've seen this before, but this, this talks about uh, the evolution of different kinds of, of cells. And we start back here, that's 3.5, this here, 3.8, but anyway, way back in here somewhere, uh, the first living organisms were formed, and uh, they went, and they, things happened along different tracks. Uh, the, the eukaryotic cell developed, the, uh, a different kind of bacterium called the Archaeans uh, developed, and uh, the eukaryotic cell got more and more complex because it incorporated uh, blue-green algae, and, and that's how the chloroplast came to be, and it incorporated bacteria. That's how the mitochondria came to be, and so on and so forth. So this, uh, th this eventually results in, in organisms that have many, uh, many cells. But that's not the only way in which complexity developed. Some organisms just got, they, their cells just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And there, and there were ways in which they became more and more uh, complex. And the, um, the acetabularia is one of those. And again, I only have this in here because it really shocked me the first time I saw one. I did not see it in the laboratory. I was just messing around in a pond that was near my house, and, uh, and there were these little acetabularia. They're not that big. They're only about a, 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 a centimeter tall, uh, 10 millimeters tall. Uh, but they're just one cell. So that's how complex a single uh, cell uh, can get. And they're beautiful. They're stunning. They're, they're this bright green and just, um, just a beautiful plant, and they're only one uh, one cell. Now, we are now uh, going to uh, uh, take the quiz and take a break, and then uh, we'll get into this trip into uh, the cell after that's through. But for right now, why don't we hand out the quizzes? And uh, so the, 
we'll take the quiz. Uh, I think we generally give 10 minutes, so that'll be for quarter after. So about 25 after, we'll reassemble. than just lay a, uh, an outline of, uh, of the cell and go through it bit by piece. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, pretend for a moment that we are small enough so that we can wander through the cell. In addition, what we will be doing is you'll, you'll be seeing the order in which the different parts of the cell were understood. And, uh, and describe. And again, it, it all started back uh, with Hook and, his, and the people that worked with Hook and, and the things that they, now again, he called these cells. He, he really didn't, wasn't thinking about what organisms were made from or anything like that when he did it. But he's the one that gave, a, gave, um, gave the title. So there, uh, one thing that we've mentioned, and we'll see it again here, and that is that the cells generally, the animal and plant cells, and I'm calling these more complex because they happen further along in the evolutionary track. Initially, the cells were very, very simple, uh, but eventually they became more complex. And if you look at uh, plant cells and animal cells, you notice a couple of things. One thing you notice at first is that they are virtually identical. There are very few differences between these two uh, cell types. But there is quite a lot of difference between these cells and the cells of bacteria, or those bacteria-like organisms called archaeans. And the two major uh, differences are right here. Uh, the, uh, the fact that there are mitochondria and, uh, and chloroplasts. And that's because at a particular time in the evolution of these cells, these, uh, these cells like you and I have, if we don't happen to have chloroplasts, but uh, other, otherwise it's quite the same, uh, is that they have these incorporations of, of these two organisms especially. But there are other things that are different as well because you know, a billion years is a long time uh, to evolve and change. So. Uh, if we're swimming around in this cell and we're taking a, taking a look at what it uh, appears uh, to be, uh, what, the first thing we see coming from the outside and going in is that in the case of the plant cell, they, uh, there are walls. And uh, here are two cells, one next to the other, and, uh, and this is the cell wall material. That cell wall material is mostly cellulose. It is the most prominent carbohydrate on the face of the earth. There is nothing that's present in greater abundance than is uh, cellulose. And when you think about it, that makes sense, right? I mean, all those plants, and they die, and the cellulose doesn't go away in a hurry. And so there, there's lots and lots of um, cellulose on the, on the face of the earth. So that's what you, that's what you see when you're going into the cell uh, to begin. But you very quickly run into another organ uh, or another uh, feature of the cell, and that is uh, the plasma membrane, the membrane that uh, goes all the way around the cell like that. That plasma membrane is very complex, but early on they didn't realize how com complex it was. It has lots of proteins in it that allow things to come and to go and, and so on. But anyway, that's the next thing that you'd see as you were uh, going uh, into the cell. That, uh, and you might also uh, notice that the cell wall itself has holes in it uh, that, were, that allow things to pass uh, um, uh, more, more easily. Now once you're in the cell, you run into lots of membranes, lots and lots of, of membranes. Uh, and when you, when, when you calculate to yourself how that could all be arranged, because generally all we get are these cross sections. 
when we calculate what that means, it, what it means is that this is a, <coughs> this is a, a compartment that's filled with hundreds and hundreds of separate rooms, things where th places where things can go on that uh, uh, can be separate from the from the rest of the of the cell, and that uh, that those membranes are called uh, endoplasmic reticulum. You, by the way, don't worry about learning these terms. That, that's not necessary. Endoplasmic reticulum, uh, again, back when e these membranes were first described, uh, were described as rough and smooth. They could find these different kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. The only reason that they were called rough and smooth is that the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum happened to have uh, the, the little bodies that are used in protein synthesis, the, uh, the ribosomes on them. And so, um, it's hard for me to see up close here, but uh, that those little bumps on there would, are, are, are a cartoon of, uh, of, of uh, ribosomes. And you'd also, uh, here's a, it would be a surprise because you'd look at that and you'd say, what's, there's a bacterium inside this cell. It looks just like a bacteria to me, a bacterium to me. But in fact, it's not. It's a mitochondrion, and it is the product, after, again, hundreds of millions of years of evolution, of the incorporation at one time early on in the development of this cell, in the evolution of this cell, of a bacterium uh, that came over time to be very useful to the, um, to the cell uh, by itself. And I'll come back to that. And this is, uh, this is very similar. This is what we. Uh, are looking at when we're looking at chloroplasts, and here again, uh, it's a um, an incorporated in this case photosynthetic bacterium, and so it's green and it has the photosynthetic apparatus uh, in it. These are ribosomes can be attached to the membrane, but they can also be loose like this and free. Uh, these don't look so loose, right? They look like they're connected, and in fact they are because these are the platforms on which protein synthesis takes place, and protein synthesis is guided by messenger RNA, which comes from DNA. Uh, so it's a good hint, if you run into these, it's a good hint that the genes are somewhere close, uh, close by. Um, now here, again, you have a hard time finding the difference between this cell, which is an animal cell, and the previous one, uh, the plant cell. You find all the same stuff. You find uh, the nucleus, you find uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the plasma membrane around the outside of the cell, all of this endoplasmic reticulum that, that makes all of these little rooms, these places where different kinds of things can, can uh, take place. So it looks very similar. No cell wall here, but there is a kind of thing that gives structure called the cytoskeleton. Uh, I forgot to mention one other thing in the plant that's uh, important not to forget, and that is that plants have this large vacuole where they store things that are generally water soluble, and they can store them for long periods of time, or, and, and that vacu vacuole can be completely emptied out so that you can't even find it or, or it can fill up, depending on the circumstance uh, that the cell finds itself uh, in. Now, uh, one of the interesting differences, again, as I mentioned, was the fact that you find these mitochondria and you find these uh, chloroplasts in these uh, cells. In the case of the chloroplast, the importance of it is that ha it has this unusual talent and ability to capture sunlight. You've heard about electrons and uh, the fact that electrons are generally found around the nucleus of a cell, and uh, they're, uh, they're often described as in orbits, but the orbits aren't as precisely defined as the pictures usually show. It's actually clouds of, uh, of, uh, of electrons, uh, uh, what appears to be a cloud in which re uh, electrons reside. But the electrons have different en energy levels, and the closer they are to the nucleus, the lower the energy level. 
but they can get kicked out further away from the nucleus and then they have a higher potential energy because when they drop back down, they give up that energy that they gained by it from uh, going, going out that far. Now that's important in photosynthesis because photosynthesis, remember, is a way in which the cell captures light. So the light comes into the cell continuously on a sunny day especially, but even on a day like today, there's light that's going into the cell and it is kicking those electrons to high energy levels. And that's the beginning of photosynthesis because when those electrons drop back down, that energy that came from the photon, from the light in the first place, kick the electron up, is captured. But it's, ca it's not, it's, it, you might think, well, it would just give off the same kind of light that it absorbed. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the light is captured in the formation of a chemical bond. So that's the first part of photosynthesis. And uh, the second part is when uh, that energy is incorporated into the bonds of, turns out, it's a very simple compound, it's sugar. It's a six carbon sugar. Glucose, not sucrose, but glucose. And that is the beginning of, uh, of the use of energy in the, in the cells. Now that sugar can be, uh, is used by this uh, organism, uh, the mitochondria. And uh, it is able to get that energy out of the sugar and transfer it to a compound and consider it, you might consider it like gasoline because it's a compound that can be used in a variety of ways to make, uh, to, to make energy available. So if we're having to synthesize particular things, the, um, uh, the mitochondrion makes the energy available for that. So these two uh, uh, organelles work uh, in concert. But, you might be saying to yourself, uh, plants have uh, the chloroplasts to make the sugar, but animals don't, so what, how does that work? And the way it works is, as I'm sure you guessed, uh, we eat plants, or we eat animals that eat plants. We eat something that has a trail back to photosynthesis, and that's why uh, plants are ab absolutely essential to our, uh, to our existence. So we're in the cell and we've uh, noticed that there are these unusual things like mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, but there's one thing we haven't mentioned yet and that's this uh, nucleus. And this is, this right here is, uh, generally speaking, the largest uh, organelle in the plant with the exception of the vacuole. It's uh, got pores in the, in the outer membrane. Uh, it seems to be the same size as, uh, as uh, chloroplast and, and uh, mitochondria, but that's just for the sake of this picture. It's actually much, much larger. And so, again, we're on a trip in the cell, we're noticing these various things along the way, and we get to the nucleus, and we go into the nucleus, and we look very carefully at what's in the nucleus, and we see this. This is one chromosome that's been isolated, uh, but that's what this is. It's a chromosome, and it is on this chromosome that the uh, genes reside. The basic substance of the chromosome is DNA, and it has all of the genes, one after uh, the other, in a line. Uh, this happens to be a, a particular <coughs> stage in, uh, the, in a chromosome's life, where it has two chromatids, but uh, don't worry about that for right now. Uh, they, th these chromosomes have the genes on them. The genes produce an RNA that, can, that, in, that carries the code of the gene, carries it out into the cytoplasm, and out in the cytoplasm the, the, the proteins are made. Uh, this is the closest we're going to uh, get to understanding what the genes are. Remember, our 
interest here was just in finding the genes, and uh, there they are. They're on the uh, uh, they're on the chromosomes. Now you may have learned at one time or another that there are genes elsewhere in the cell as, as well, and where would you expect them? Well, remember the, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were former prokaryotic organisms, and they have a, 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 a chromosome as well. Theirs is a little different, it's a circular chromosome, and it has, but it has genes on it just like these uh, chromosomes here. So, uh, so you do find these genes elsewhere in the cell associated with those, what used to be eons ago, um, uh, prokaryotic organisms or, or bacteria. Now if you take a cell and you treat it exactly right, you can, act, you can isolate these chromosomes. And so here you, here you have a whole bunch of them. These are all of the chromosomes that appear in human cells, in your cells and my cells. And here they all are. And uh, it was noticed, and again this goes way back to Mendel. They couldn't do it at that time, but knowing what Mendel had determined, they were, there was, the people felt strongly that these chromosomes probably came in pairs. And so they would very carefully look at the, the whole group of them laid out like this, and they would say, well, let's see if we can find pairs among those chromosomes. And sure enough, you could find ones that seemed to pair up. If you look at this whole group here, they aren't exactly identical. This one seems to be shorter than that one and so forth, but they're very close to identical. And there are different ways in which they can be identified, like these two might be a little bit of a different length, but if you look at the way they, they band under, with certain dyes, they look very similar. So you find this whole group of, uh, of paired chromosomes. We uh, are always said to have 46 chromosomes. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the last pair that we're looking for, this is, it happens to be a female. A female has, instead of an X and a Y, it has two X chromosomes. Uh, and these are all of the chromosomes that exist in a, in, a, in a human cell. So that's where uh, the genes are. And that's what they, uh, and, and what they do is they control everything that happens in the cell, most everything that happens in the cell, because that's, uh, that's what genes do. Genes make proteins, and uh, genes make messenger RNA, and messenger RNA makes protein, and protein determines what happens in our cell. Sometimes those proteins are enzymes, and sometimes they're structural proteins, but it's the proteins that make up what we are. So we've gotten to uh, where we wanted to get with regard to uh, searching for the genes. And that's where we're going to stop. There are a hundred different ways we could go here, but uh, this is where we're going to stop with genes. And uh, remind me next time, we're talking about, uh, what are we talking about next time? Oh, what, next time we're talking about cancer. And uh, the interesting thing about cancer is that, uh, as I said to you, I think in an earlier lecture, all of us in this room have had cancer. And we've probably had it, have, we've probably had it dozens of times. But our immune system deals with the cancer. So we're going to start out by talking about cancer and what we know of as cancer, which is when it escapes our usual mechanism for shutting down cancer. And, uh, uh, and we'll, so we'll talk about that first, and then we'll get into the immune system, which is the way in which most of the time when we get cancer, we deal with it. We deal with it uh, because we have an immune system that is unusually efficient and takes care of those not self cells that cancer is. So that's what we're going to talk about next time, and I'll see you then. I hope you get home okay in the rain. <laughs>
各位同学，有人不在我的妹啊吗？作业请先寄给我。应该都有收到我寄电子信吧？台大的信箱，你去看一下，我寄几封给你。